when couples are noticing a problem, they tend to take about seven years to actually address it. Oh my God. It's long that's, longer, that's longer than we've been together. <laughs> yes. oh We're not God. even there yet. Seven years? Yeah. I did have an issue the first day I met you that I'm going to get to in a month from now. Okay. <laughs> we'll be together seven, seven years, years in a exactly. month. And you'll yeah. finally complain about it seven years later. <laughs> <laughs> Shandy. Welcome back to Dear Shandy listeners. Hello, Andy. Hello. It's an exciting day. It is. I love our guest days. Yes. And we this is good. We give good guests. We I do think. give good guests. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we have a particularly good one today. Mm -hmm. We are joined by a licensed family and marriage therapist who is a certified clinical trauma professional. Mm. No big deal. She is the founder of A Better Life Therapy, a network of therapists providing services both online and in person in Philadelphia, New Jersey, and California. Let me know if I missed a state there. You got it. I got it. We are joined today by Elizabeth Earnshaw. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're a great sport. Uh, today's questions are falling into two categories. The first is confessions of a family and marriage therapist, and the second half is questions about people's relationships. And I really let this just sort of go with the flow in the direction that our listeners sort of took it. And it was interesting to me, honestly, because when we had a sex therapist on, 90% of the questions were about sex, like their own experiences. Mm -hmm. But in the case of you, people really wanted to know what you encountered in your profession. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious to see what they asked. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get right to it. First off, and this was very common. What traits do you consistently see in couples who not only last, but thrive? Hmm, that's a good question. So there are a few traits that you see again and again in couples who thrive. I like how it wasn't just about lasting because <laughs> disaster couples can last for a long time, even so when true. they shouldn't. <laughs> so true. Um, but the traits that couples show that thrive, you know, number one is that they tend to have pretty good communication skills. What I mean by that is that even when things are tough, they're still able to respectfully communicate. It doesn't mean that they don't show that they're angry and that they never raise their voice and that, um, you know, they never express that they're upset, but they don't utilize things like criticism or contempt. Um, contempt is like belittling. Um, they don't get defensive. They don't shut each other out. So they're able to talk through hard stuff. The other thing that couples do that thrive is they make intentional time for each other. So even when it's hard, even when they've got kids and work, um, hobbies, they are intentional about having rituals. So it might be small things like every morning they have coffee together really quickly, or they walk each other to each other's cars before they go off to work or whatever it is. But they tend to have patterns of connecting, which are reliable. And the other thing that they do is that they make bids for each other's connection. So um, there is, I don't know if you've ever heard of Gottman Method Therapy, but the Gottman Institute has done a ton of research on couples. And the couples who do really well, they are constantly trying to connect with each other throughout the time, the, the day, thousands of times a day. Um, and their partner tends to be really good at responding to those attempts and responds to about 80% of them. And now I'm not talking about someone who's saying, you're at work, you need to call me back. Why haven't you ca contacted me? What's going on? But there's these little moments where it's like, I might say something like, wow, it looks beautiful outside. And that's me attempting to connect with the other human in the room. And masters of relationships are really good at turning towards that in some way. So they might not talk about the weather for 15 minutes, but they might like look up over at the window and say, you're right. It is really nice outside today. Ooh. Oh, I love that. I mean, yeah. those are all so great, but that last one, mm -hmm. because you would think that that intentional connection is like, <clears throat> we're going to talk about us right now. Like we're going to connect, but it's actually just more almost observational, like just it's interacting mm -hmm. on a simple level, I would think. Yeah, the simple things, the couples that thrive do lots and lots of simple things that are often even hard to track. 
They're not doing necessarily these huge grand gestures. Um, they do those for fun. That's like the icing on top, right? It's like, we're so great that I also want to surprise you with this amazing dinner or something like that. But the, the couples who feel really good with each other, they're doing lots of little things um, to connect with each other throughout the day. That makes sense. It I does. mean, you want to just keep sort of being aware that you're connected to another person. It's like, <clears throat> it's both, morning. We're, we're, both, both, we're, both we're just both like so choking on our own phlegm. I'm not sure what's happening here. It's a very phlegmy morning. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> it's like a typhoid ward. So, um, Anyway, what I was saying was, it's like you're constantly checking in, almost like software that's like constantly checking the location. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. like you're like, oh, I'm in this partnership. I'm in this partnership. Yeah. It's like as opposed to trying to isolate, be like, I want to be alone. Like, I don't I want to make believe that I'm not I'm separate from this individual. I also feel val <laughs> validated by this, Elizabeth, because um, I was on The Bachelor several years ago, and it always bothered me in that experience how whenever you were with the person you were ostensibly supposed to end up engaged to, you were just encouraged to talk about your relationship constantly. When I was just wanted to do things so that you could observe your surroundings. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't want to just talk about our connection 24-7. Right. I want to go for a walk where we can like look at the birds and talk about the birds because that actually <laughs> says, in my opinion, every bit as much about your relationship. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if you have to like talk about it all the time, that usually to me would kind of show that those little moments aren't happening, right? Mm -hmm. Because if those are happening, then we don't need to sit down 15 times a day and say, do you like me? What do you <laughs> think about this? Um, because you recognize that the person likes you, right? They put their cell phone down when you're sharing a story or they are willing to walk to the mailbox with you to grab the mail so that you can have a chit chat at the end of the day. So. These little things, they really build a sense of reliability in the relationship and, and trust and just security. Yeah, it's That's almost like the more mundane things you discuss on a daily basis, the more solid the connection is because you're just literally like sharing everything. Yeah. You know, and because everything else is there that the mundane is worth discussing. Right. Exactly. You don't have to talk about big issues. Yeah. You can just say, oh, it's as you said, oh, it's chilly today. <laughs> yes, it is chilly. <laughs> Good stuff. OK, Elizabeth, can you tell based on your experience, your expertise, and you might not, I don't know if you can answer some of these. Can you tell after you first meet a couple whether or not they're going to last? A lot of people wanted to know this. <laughs> That's a good question. So there are certain indicators that a couple's not going to last. I think that it's a little more nuanced than that. Like if we put everyone in a research lab and you had everything completely controlled, you could probably mostly identify you know, which people aren't going to last very long. But because that's not really how human nature is, nor the first time you're meeting somebody, it's a little more complicated. And if certain things are chronic and they're not changed, then yeah, the, the relationship is likely to end. If it's not by divorce, it's at least through intimacy. So mm -hmm. you might still stay together until you're 90, but have no connection and no intimacy. Um, the indicators of that are constant turning away so I talked about those bids and the healthy couples are saying, you know, someone sighs like oh, that's an, a, that's a bid for connection. And in a healthy couple, someone goes, what's up? Mm. And the other person might even say nothing. <laughs> but that was it. That was a turn towards they turn towards the person. Mm. Now, if people are turning away, what they might do is they keep looking on their phone. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I say, look outside. Um, isn't it beautiful? And they're like still having a separate conversation. They haven't even responded to that. Um, the other indicator is turning against. So it's, wow, isn't that house beautiful? You're just kind of dreaming and, and oh, thinking. I of hate this one. <laughs> I hate this one. It Tell drives me, why me nuts. Do why do you hate it? <laughs> because you're trying to fight. You're try you're just taking the counter. You're gonna say they always disagree. You're like, well, yeah, that, yeah. that's what you were gonna say, right? Totally. Sorry. Yep. Okay, yeah. Oh, I've had that before. It drives me nuts. And I don't know whether it's supposed to the person's just super annoying and that's the way that they create <laughs> conversation, or they hate me and they just wanna we like 
you know, always be the counter. But we've both been in that relationship. I, that is my biggest pet peeve. I'm I'm stating a fact that is <laughs> not inarguable. Just don't Probably disagree don't with me. When that happens, they oh, don't laugh. So would you one. say it's being Worst. contrarian, sort of just for the sake of it? Sometimes not just for the sake of it. Sometimes so you know, if we're going to look at it therapeutically, sometimes what has happened is that the other person's anxiety gets in the way. So um, let's say, and this happens every now and then in every couple, let's say that I am in a furniture store. I love buying new furniture. And I say to my husband, oh my gosh, I want that couch. The best response he could give me is, what do you like about it? Because that's turning towards, but he's mm. a human. And so he might say, oh, no way, we're not getting that right? That's turning against. Now, if that only happens once in a while, it's no big deal. But if every single time I'm trying to connect with my partner, they're saying, ooh, what do you like about that? Or that's a dumb idea. Or we could never afford that. Or why do you keep talking about something like that? And they shut it down over and over and over again. It makes sense. We're going to stop having the energy to even share. Mm -hmm start to keep things to ourselves and that energy goes somewhere else. So we'll either buy the couch behind their back or find other people in our lives who support the purchase of the couch and become more connected with them. Or we disconnect from ourselves and we just say, fine, I don't need couches anymore. I know this is a silly example. <laughs> I, I love no, the example. No, it's a great example. And it's probably a very real example. <laughs> it's a real example. Fine. I a lot of couch furniture. conflict in relationships. <laughs> a lot of furniture conflict, right? Definitely. <laughs> it matters. <laughs> Yeah. And so then in disconnecting with myself and saying, okay, whatever, I'm just not going to decorate anymore, then our connection is, is wounded there too. So when there's a lot of turning against, um, intimacy falls apart and relationships start mm -hmm. to fall apart too. So sometimes it might be like my husband's anxiety is like, holy hell, Liz, why do you think that you can spend another X amount of money on another piece of furniture? We just bought whatever last week. And the thing that I talk to people about is, can you talk about the anxiety instead, but put pause? Liz, what do you like about the couch? Oh, it's so, I just love the color. Okay, well, could we talk about it first? Because I'm feeling a little nervous about the cost. That's a little different, right? Mm -hmm. It's not shutting it, it's still connecting. Um, and so when people aren't just being jerks and they're actually anxious, that's the way to kind of shift that a little bit. Mm. Those people drive me crazy. Yeah. But I, it is interesting to consider that in another relationship, they might not be that way. Right. I think it's like microaggression. It's like little microaggressions. It's like they don't even realize it, but they're trying to create aggression because there's something wrong. Oh, it's wrong. totally aggression. It's yeah. totally, yeah. So that's a big one. The other is using the four horsemen. Um, if you see couples utilizing that chronically, um, then... The relationship is really unlikely to last. Do you know what the four horsemen are? No, I was. I know biblically what they are. My <laughs> no, knowledge it's... of the Bible is very extensive, even though I'm Jewish. Four <laughs> horsemen of the apocalypse. Anyway, what are the four, four horsemen, horsemen of not the apocalypse? <laughs> no, it's exactly. It's a play off of the four horsemen of the apocalypse because okay. when you see them, it means the end is near <laughs> in a relationship. Right. Ah, okay. Now when it makes sense. <laughs> couples get into a conflict cycle where there is a lot of criticism, defensiveness, um, the word is contempt. But what that means for anyone that doesn't know is it is um, mean spirited sarcasm and looking down upon the other person. So things like I would never clean a sink like that. Where, where did you learn that? And there's like a face. Obviously, Ooh. people can't see my face if they're just listening. But it's when one side of your mouth goes up, one side of your nose goes up, and one eyebrow goes up, someone's showing contempt. If you ever see people doing that. Oh, wow. It's half of a disgust face. You're doing a good job there, Andy. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> one. It's the only facial expression that only uses one side of the face. <laughs> that's so specific. I love it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. A lot I of good tidbits happening here. Wait, so the four horsemen are these four... Yeah, they're the sign of the apocalypse, like the four horse. I don't know what all the details. But so if you're criticizing constantly in your relationship, if you're saying things like you're putting a problem inside of the other pro inside of the person. That's what criticism is. Mm -hmm. So instead of pointing out behavior you don't like, you're saying that they're an issue. You're so lazy. You never want to help around the house. You always forget about me. You 
you don't so always never the word are like you are selfish criticism so -hmm. when you're bringing up issues through criticism what then tends to happen is the other person defends themselves I'm not always selfish. You're always selfish. Or how could you say I'm selfish? I'm the one who quit my job last year to make our family work. Or how could you tell me I'm the mess? Did you see the inside of your car? Um, And then what tends to happen is it cascades into something called either stonewalling or contempt, like I said. And so one person will get really closed off. Well, F this, I don't want to talk anymore. And they'll just become a stonewall. And the other person will say things like, your mother would be ashamed of you. Um, you disgust me. I, I don't even want to look at you anymore. You know, if, if I would have known who I was marrying, I would have never married you. You're pathetic. So when oh these, God, these are horrible. horrible. Stop, stop. <laughs> it's bad, right? But it's real and it happens. And um, when people don't own that they're doing those things and then learn new ways to express their anger, um, disappointment, whatever, then yeah, it usually doesn't last very long. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> what percentage of couples who come to you or who generally seek therapy together end up breaking up, would you say? I don't know. If I don't know an exact that. percentage, um, but not many end up breaking up. So I would say like my whole career as a therapist, I've maybe had 20 couples break up, but I've seen hundreds and hundreds of couples. So not a lot of people that I end up seeing break up when they do. Um, it's usually wow. for a pretty good reason. It's usually the right thing for them. So I would say that the majority of people who end up coming to couples therapy are fairly committed to figuring it out. It's a pretty vulnerable. Yeah, experience. it makes sense that they would. The fact that they're even coming to it together means that they're both committed to trying to make it work. Right. Well, I, I did couples therapy once. I was committed to ending the relationship through couples therapy. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. To ending it. Yeah. It can be used as a sort um like a a way to kind of end it non-conflictually, right? Like yeah. trying to end it in the best way possible. So like a mediation. It's it's like instead of, you know, negotiating with your adversary, you have a mediator. Yeah. It makes things easier. I didn't know you went to couples therapy. Yeah. With with uh with Margie. Oh really? Yeah. We had Margie on the podcast, by the yeah, way. Yeah, she's my good friend now. I can talk about her. <laughs> oh, she's also a therapist. A <laughs> therapist. <laughs> and was it helpful to help you end? Did it? Help yes, you? it yeah. brought it to a head. It made it real. We made us realize that it was dead, dead shark. That's I good. Th- you, yeah, I was gonna say most people that do end it. So I will say that there are people who come for one session and they never come back because mm-hmm. they're not committed to trying to make it um, a respectful process either way, right? So they kind of just disappear. I don't know what happens to them. And then the people who end up ending their relationship through couples therapy, it's usually a much more productive way to end a relationship. It's not, um, it's actually a good thing usually because Mm -hmm. they say what they need to say. They move forward um, in a way that is respectful to both people. Um, Yeah. We interrupt this program to bring you... An emergency broadcast. (laughs) An emergency broadcast. We are talking, of course, about the Hello Tushy Bidet, which you can affix to your existing toilet. And save trees and save rear ends. Yes. I honestly believe the only reason why someone wouldn't want a bidet in their life is because they've never tried one. Yeah. It's one of those, like, how did I live without this before things. It is a win-win win i'm actually i'm thinking of all the wins there's <laughs> win there's four wins okay the toilet paper one is the trees yeah two is cleanliness cleanliness yeah three is you stimulation. actually okay i was getting okay fine three will be stimulation yeah uh-huh. and four is your actual orifice will be less chafed that's true actually chafing is a as a concern, it's a, it's a, especially if you're using some crappy toilet paper, it's a really good return on investment. And it doesn't. It's not like you're. It's not like some big appliance you're bringing into the house. It's like nothing. It's just like some little extra tiny thing you put on your toilet seat. Yeah, it's really easy. Yeah. Anyway, I I love it. We're fans. If you would like those four wins in your life, 
and in your bathroom and for your derriere. You can go to hellotushy.com slash Shandy for 10% off plus free shipping. Get 10% off plus free shipping and get your butt clean at hellotushy.com slash Shandy. That's hellotushy.com slash Shandy. You memorized your line. I did. Good job. Thank you. (laughs) Have you ever had a couple where you felt like clearly they should break up, but they just weren't breaking up? And has it ever been difficult for you to navigate that and... (laughs) Like, I know you probably can't just be like, you guys should break up, you know? Have you ever just sort of had to dance around that? That's a good question. Yeah, so I don't usually dance around it too much. Um, I will never say you should break up, um, but I certainly would say things like, you know, we've been working together for this many months and there's all these indicators that you're not happy together, that you're not um, able to function together in the way that you're expressing have you ever considered that this might not be the right match? It might not be a failing on either part. Um, so I do help people to start to like negotiate other options, right? And sometimes I'll bring up, you know, you've tried this, it's not changing things for you. Here are a couple other options. What do you think about each of these? You know, if one option is that it stays this way, what's that gonna mean for your life? If the other option is that you try this this other thing, you go on another retreat, you find another therapist, what does that mean for your life? The third option is that the relationship ends, what does that mean for your life? So um, I will bring it up, certainly. I would never let people suffer and have me like co-sign that, mm-hmm. right? I think that there's a fine line between being too passive and too involved you mm-hmm. don't want to make people's life decisions. But as a professional, I think it's super important that you're not allowing like pain and suffering to happen in front of you and making people believe um, that you think it's going to change. Sure. Your job is not to save relationships. Your job is to have relationships go their natural course. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to my job, I think of it is to protect the relationship from further harm. Mm -hmm. So if that means that the only way that can be protected is that a couple separates, um, that way they don't continue to devolve into more chaotic conflict and more distance, then that's, that might be the right path for them. Um, some therapists do take a relationship saving approach. Um, I don't, I take a, let's not cause more harm what's going to be the best for your relationship and for the health of both individuals. Oh, I love that though. Yeah. Some relationships just really aren't worth salvaging. That's just the truth. It's true. Uh, pro- probably, probably most. Most? Probably most. I would like to think that if a couple's at the point where they're going to therapy, then maybe there is some, you know, there's something they're trying to work together for. Well, but... you can make the uh, counter argument as well. Like, That's true. It's like, why are you calling into a podcast about your relationship? Yeah. We always, <laughs> same, same whenever argument. people call in for our advice, we're like, well, you did write into a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What would you say are the most common issues a couple will come to you about? And are there trends among men versus women? Hmm. That's a good question. So most common issues that people come for are, there's two, but then we have to break them down usually. Most people that come, they say that they are coming for communication issues, which is just like my favorite problem to solve because I'm like, what does that even mean, right? (laughs) Um, But that will be what they, it's called a presenting problem. That'll be what they present is the problem that breaks down into so many things, right? For some people, it might literally be, we don't talk ever. And so what's the underlying cause of that? Is it that there's past resentment? Is there some attachment stuff going on? Like what's happening? Others, the communication issue is when we fight, we are really problematic. Um, For others, it might be, I just don't like how they connect with me. You know, I wish that, This other person would ask me more intimate questions. I wish they were more romantic. So um, when people don't really know what's going on, but they know there's a problem, they say communication issues. (laughs) And then the other is usually a bigger, more obvious issue where people will come in and they'll say, we're about to break up and we want to figure out if we want to do that or someone had an affair. So, and those are usually very clear, right? It's like, okay, we know what you're coming in for, but the very most common is, 
people say communication issues. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And for the infidelity, when you said someone had an affair, is it more common to see that among men or women? Both. Both. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Just curious. Yeah, I, you know, I work with just as many couples where the um, female partner had an affair as the male partner did. There's usually different feelings around, you know, how that manifests a little bit. Um, but yeah, it it's pretty, it happens across the board with all types of relationships. Um, and there's different reasons that people are usually motivated into affairs, but yeah. Do you believe that any couple can make it work regardless of incompatibility if they work at it hard enough? Well, Whether or not you think they should. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my question would be, what's the definition of making it work? So could any couple choose to say, we're never going to break up and we're going to live in the same house together until we die? I mean, sure. Like, what are you willing to sacrifice and give up and be uncomfortable with and tolerate? I guess any human beings can tolerate whatever if they put their minds to it. <laughs> um, if work means we can actually enjoy life together and be interdependent and support each other's growth and feel good and feel as if we're mostly reliable with each other and respectful and responsive to each other's needs. No, I don't think that any couple can make it work. I love the honesty because, yeah, I mean, in my unprofessional opinion, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say? I'm just curious, um, with uh, relationships that experience infidelity, is there a certain percentage of those relationships you see that survive that infidelity or like the majority mm -hmm. or survive or the majority fail as a result of that? It's a good question. I would say a lot of them survive. Um, a lot of people do get through infidelity. Again, you have to remember the group of people I'm working with are people who are dedicated to following the steps that it would take to work through infidelity. So I'm not seeing um, the people who might be in a relationship in which the one partner that um, had the relational norm violation is what it's considered, mm -hmm. um, isn't taking responsibility, right? So I am, I'm having access and connection with partners who are saying, you know, we have this issue, we do want to get through it. And the, the partner who violated the relational norm and, and had an affair is at least there, right? And because they're there, there's more opportunity to say, these are the things you need to do to improve the situation and to heal this trust wounding that has occurred. Now, even with that, there are still some, some times where they can't get through it either because that partner um, doesn't want to build the trust. They're not willing to put in the really, I mean, it's very uncomfortable work to rebuild that trust or because the other partner just truly cannot forgive. Um, and when that happens, it's really great to be in the therapeutic environment because again, the therapist can point out, I can see that you wish you could, but we've been working on this for months and either you, um, the person who violated the relationship, aren't willing to do the five things I've told you would be really helpful or they've done everything and you as the person who was violated aren't able to like kind of step past that line towards this willingness to forgive. And in those situations, you at least have the therapist who can point that out to you. Um, but I would say a lot of people make it through affairs and that honestly affairs aren't usually the most problematic issue. Mm -hmm. I can totally see that. Yeah. Because that's just like, a, that's just an, an occurrence and it's an event. I mean, sometimes it it's, can be a long right, event. It's not a pattern unless it's a pattern. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And the more yeah. patterned it is, the harder it is to um, come right. back. From. Right. You know, yes, if it yes. was an, aff an affair with one affair partner or something like that, people can come back. But what will tend to happen when it, it can't move forward is when there are subsequent lies that continue to be mm -hmm. unraveled. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's like, oh, I thought it was just this one affair, but now I'm learning that you've had five others. And I've also learned that you told somebody we weren't even married. And, and, oh, and so when there's a patterned violation, it's pretty hard to come back from that. Understandably. Right. 
Okay, your professional opinion on staying together for the children. Mm. It's a complicated one, right? I mm -hmm. think that it's easy to say, you know, I think sometimes we we move out of nuance and we move into these very like um, <laughs> polar opinions where people will say, oh, you should never stay together for the children. It's never healthy for the children. And then we kind of forget the reality of child development and, and how children do receive things, or we get on the other end of it where it's like, you should always stay together for the children and, you know, divorce will harm them and da, 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 da. I think that it's different for every couple. You know, I've worked with many couples that are like, I hear this advice that says it's going to damage my kin kids for us to stay together. And financially, we can't part. It's just not realistic. It will be really bad for our family. We'll fall apart. We won't be able to afford housing. So what can we do to stay together in a way that protects the kids um, as much as possible, protects us as much as possible, but works within the realities? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that if we don't recognize that there are some people where that's the reality, then we're leaving out a lot. Um, what I will say is that if your relationship is causing you so much distress that you can't show up as a parent anymore to your, your kids. So it's causing you to have depression. Um, it's causing you to have to continually remove yourself. It's abusive. Then you have to weigh the pros and cons. Like, yes, your child might be very upset about the end of a relationship. There's certainly ways to navigate that though through conversation. Um, to figure out what to do next, because at the end of the day, they need security and they need parents who are able to kind of show up in a healthy way for them. Mm -hmm. So I just think there's so much nuance and I don't think you can make a decision for I your family from like an yeah. Instagram I Post? love that answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah and I love that answer. Also, I feel like it applies to so much in the world today. Just, you know, the polarizing opinions, the polar opposite opinions, and just sort of the loss of the nuance of all the gray area in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That was, we had the, the one Q&A, the woman who wrote in had a <clears throat> very similar problem. Um, and it, it comes down to, is, is a child, a young child going to be better off living with an incredibly unhappy mother and or possibly father with a happy mother who's just not in the household mm. all the time yeah. or vice versa. And probably will be better off with a happy mom who's not in the household if the mom has the privilege to not be in the household. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that when we boil it down to like these um, info and I mean, I'm on it, I'm on Instagram, but there's like a lot of shame that can be built up because it's like. Well, everything I'm reading says that like a healthy child is with a healthy mom, but like I truly don't have the means to separate or I don't have the support to separate. So now is my child going to be destined um, to struggle as well? No, like you have to look at your situation and what you have access to where you can tap into supports what's real for you. Your child will be okay. You probably do need to get support for the way in which you manage this with your child, right? Um, and if you are a happy mom that can go live somewhere else and be separate or a happy dad or caretaker or whatever, um, that's wonderful. And yes, your child in that scenario will probably be better off. Um, but if you can't, for whatever reason that I probably can't even think of right now because we're humans with so many nuances. I want you to also know that your child is not destined to like live a life of, um, you know, awful feelings and experiences that that can be buffered and that, um, you know, professionals can kind of help you work through your reality to, to get the best outcome for your kid within mm -hmm. the, the situation. Such a great answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have two more of these and then we're gonna move on to the relationship questions. In your experience, do you see a correlation between socioeconomic class and happiness in a marriage? I don't actually, not in my experience. I'm sure that there's data that says that there's some sort of correlation, but I actually work with people from all socioeconomic uh, classes. So 
I see people who, you know, can pay me zero dollars to see me and they have very happy marriages. I see people who pay me zero dollars and they have terrible marriages. I see people who pay me my full fee. So I work on a sliding scale um, based on ability to pay. And so I see people who pay my full fee who are very, very happy in a marriage and they have um, lots of financial um, security. And I see people with financial security who are not happy. I think that there are different stressors. And I think that for people who don't have financial security, it can be more challenging to work through the stressors. There's also sometimes a little more resilience there. Um, so they can work through those stressors, but there's very different challenges a lot of the time. Okay, final question in the confessions. Elizabeth, are there any alternative relationship models that you've seen succeed and therefore would recommend? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've seen many alternative relationship models succeed. I, I work with people who are um, practicing consensual, consensual non-monogamy. Um, I've worked with poly couples. I've worked with, or they wouldn't be couples. I've worked with poly <laughs> relationships. I've worked with... Um, people who live apart, you know, so they live in different states. I've worked with people who live in different countries. Um, I've worked with people who get married, people who don't get married, um, people who are divorced, but still live together because they want to parent together and they have relationships wow. um, outside of the outside of that relationship. And their kids are very aware. Um, I've worked with a lot of different relationship um, situations. And when people have good boundaries, when they communicate well, when they can hold on to a sense of themselves while still caring about the other or the others in the relationship, almost any dynamic can kind of thrive. Wow. I'm fascinated about these divorced people living together. I know that was the one that <laughs> stuck out to <laughs> me I've too. I've worked with that several times. Really? It's high level. That is high that's level. Yeah. A new thing, a new trend, maybe not a trend because it works for people, but it's, it feels very evolved to me. Yeah, they're like dating. Like, will they so bring, they bring wow. people home? Yeah, so all different things. I mean, so I've had people who they will live together fully, even though they're separate. So both will be in the home at the same time with the kids, and um, they might have a separate living space where if they like have a night off, they could date and they could go to the other space um, where they also are allowed to bring their partners home. The kids usually are very um, aware for quite a while that this is going to slowly happen. I've worked with people where they live together, but they're on and off. So parent A might be at home during the week and then parent B goes to the apartment and then they switch, parent B comes back and parent A uses the apartment. Um, some are dating and some are not because that wasn't why they decided to end the marriage. Um, you know, they're invested in their careers or whatever. And so they are co-parenting and living together, but they That's don't, incredible. they sleep in different bedrooms and yeah. I'm so impressive. impressed. Impressive. Very impressed with that. Okay. So frequently asked questions surrounding people's relationships. This one came a lot. When do you think a couple should consider therapy? And do you think it could be something preventative a couple could do to avoid problems down the road? Yeah, so um, I see couples a lot that are doing preventative therapy. Um, they come in because they're newly married or they're about to have a baby, or I see a lot of people in the dating stages. And it's a fantastic way just to talk about values, communication styles, um, you know, your own personal challenges and hangups and relationships and how you like to work through those. So I think that it's a fantastic thing to do proactively. Um, when couples are noticing a problem, they tend to take about seven years to actually address it. Oh my God, that's, long that's, longer, that's longer than we've been together. <laughs> yes. 
Oh we're not God. even there yet. Seven years? Yeah. I did have an issue the first day I met you that I'm going to get to in a month from now. Okay. <laughs> we'll be together seven, seven years, years in a exactly. month. And then you'll finally complain about it seven years later. <laughs> <laughs> Which I know we're laughing, but it's kind of true. Like people will come in after being together for seven years and they'll be like, well, the first week we were dating, you did this thing too. And no yeah. way. Whoa. Wow, that's a slow play. That is a slow play. <laughs> It's a very slow play. And it makes sense. We tend to like over time rewrite history based off of our experiences. So the thing we called quirky and endearing, when we get mad at somebody, we start to call it, you know, ridiculous, just annoying, something we dislike. Um, but what I suggest is that you take care of issues within, you know, the first month of them happening, because the sooner you take care of them, the sooner you can resolve that instead of allowing it to be like a wound that just keeps getting scabbed over. Mm. And then what happens is couples build a ledger and they start to hold this ledger. So it's like, well, in you know, 2007, mm. um, we never talked about this. And then when we had the baby, you wouldn't wake up in the middle of the night, but I didn't say anything. But now that I have a broken leg and you're not helping me, so it becomes a debt. Mm. I dated a guy like that once where I, I'm very like react, like I'll get mad about something in the moment. I can't hold it in. And then he would get mad at me like once a year. And it was like this full laundry <laughs> list of all these things that he had saved up. And I was like, ah, and yeah. you can't do anything about it at that point. Right. You're like, oh, so sorry. How can I help with this? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone has a ledger, everyone, even great relationships. There's a ledger, but some people just, it's like never used. It's just kind of like, eh, whatever. It's not They're worth human it. beings. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think, it, do you think that's healthy for there to be just like a little tiny ledger? <laughs> I think that you bring up a good point is that it's human. <laughs> yeah. So we all have them, right? I mean, yeah. I'm a relationship therapist. And of course there's things in my head where if I'm mad at my husband, I could pull it out, right? Yeah. Oh, five <laughs> weeks ago, you didn't do X, Y, and Z. But the more that you build up and you don't take care of, the easier it becomes to demean, degrade, disrespect your partner because you've decided that they're indebted to you, that they are bad, that they haven't done good within the relationship. Um, and when we start to think that about people, we become jerks towards them. Mm -hmm. And so the sooner you can say, Ooh, you really upset me. There's a little debt to pay here <laughs> with what you did last week. And then that can get, you know, that can get back to an equal playing field together. Um, the easier it is to recover. Okay. These next few have come up a lot in general on our podcast. But when I mentioned that you were coming on, there was sort of like another influx of them. And the three main ones, I don't think will be surprising to you. The first one is opposing political or religious views. The other one is being on different pages about housework slash cleanliness. And the next one after that is about wanting to live in different places. So we'll, we'll go in order. So the first one, do you have advice for a couple where each partner has opposing political or religious views? Yeah, so they actually, all three of those questions fall into the same category. <laughs> okay, I thought they might, which is why I sort of gave them to you as an umbrella statement. So feel free to answer them all at once if that's easier. So when we're in relation with another person, no matter what, we're gonna have differences. And it could be whatever you want to throw out. It could be a different political view. It could be a different way that you like to put your toothbrush on the counter versus in a <laughs> container. It could be um, different ways of navigating social life, navigating cleanliness, navigating where you want to live, how you want to live, um, how much you like to put into your work and how much you don't like to put into it. So you are not going to meet a person where you don't have a difference and you're really not going to meet a person where you don't have a big difference. Mm -hmm. It's nearly impossible. You're going to have a big difference. The thing about couples who do well is not that there's a difference. It's that they're really good at navigating and respecting that there's a difference and figuring out how to create a win-win solution around it. Mm 
So whether it's we have differing political views or I always dreamed of living in Spain, but you want to stay in your hometown, it doesn't matter. There's some couples that can navigate that issue almost flawlessly, right? They're like, I'm going to figure out how to make us both feel good here because I care about what we both want. And then there's others that consistently want to make the other person them. Mm. I can't believe you think this way. I want you to think my way. And when you get into this, you get into what's called gridlock. And gridlock is often caused because you feel threatened in your own dream. You feel threatened in your own values. And you feel like if you can't get the other person to fully come to your side and agree with you, that you're not going to have your dreams met or your values aren't going to be lived within. Now, sometimes that's a truth. Sometimes you might not be able to follow your dream and follow the other person's dream. Sometimes there might be such a differing political view that it like it's not possible to live within your value, you know, because the other person is like way over there. But the majority of the time, it's called a perpetual problem. And the majority of our problems in relationships are perpetual what we can do is we can say, I really can honor that you're different than me. I don't have to shut down the fact that you've always dreamed about traveling the world and that that's where you've always wanted to put your money. And you don't have to shut down the fact that I don't like spending money and that I'm much more comfortable being in my home. Now, what does this mean for both of us? And how do, we, how do we come to temporary agreements over and over and over again about how we'll navigate that? And what that might look like is, well, this year we have no money in the bank account. So you know what our temporary agreement will be for the sake of your security, for your needs to save money, together we'll agree to save. But after we save, then our next agreement is going to be that every year we use a percentage of that to travel. I don't love traveling, but I'm going to do that for you. Um, so you have to figure out how do you honor both people? A lot of couples break up because they don't know how to do that. They want the other person to be them. It reminds me of, we had on the co-author of The Ethical Slut, which is a book about polyamory. And that was pretty much a major takeaway of sort of navigating that lifestyle in a relationship is these ongoing agreements, because it's something you mutually agree to. And then if you no longer agree to it, then you can come up with a new agreement. But I just love that sort of, it kind of is like these like landmarks that you both agree to, and it doesn't have to be forever on each agreement. And it's, it's just so much more doable. It's just less daunting than being like, oh, you can never live in Spain. You know, I never want to live in Spain. So do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or <clears throat> I will allow you to squeeze the toothpaste from the middle. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is just. He's a big problem with how I squeeze the year. <laughs> Are you, you spit all over the sink, it's all right this year, but can we check back in December and see? <laughs> <laughs> you, la you laugh, but I bet you and your husband have differing toothpaste squeezing techniques. Oh, yes. And thank God we have two different sinks with two different toothpaste. <laughs> oh, ah. there's a solution. We should think about that. <laughs> that's that's where it's at. Yeah. She's a she's a middle squeezer. I'm a bottom squeezer. Obviously, bottom oh. squeezers are the more decent people. <laughs> I'm a middle squeezer. I'm yeah. very indecent. <laughs> this, this this proves my point that the middle squeezing is a female trait. Well, then you're gonna you're gonna start getting hate about that. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I'll take it. Andy I'll likes to make that. sweeping Over statements, the and then we get a lot of angry emails. <laughs> yes. I do particularly like the hate about toothpaste. You really have to yeah, be, be, be passionate. passionate about toothpaste. Yeah. Well, you're the one that keeps bringing it up. I, I, I stand by it. I'm not I'm not changing my tune. It's a persistent problem. I'm going to check my husband's toothpaste squeezing after this. Yeah, get, back, get back to us. It might. Don't don't blame me if you guys have a fight about it. Elizabeth, you just answered Pretty much all of those in one fell swoop because it was a lot of these sort of just differing opinions. He does this. I see it like this. How do we come to an agreement? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to move on to family. A lot of these revolved around children, how confident a couple should be in knowing they want children. 
uh, when they should know if they don't want children or if they shouldn't have children, and then dealing with in-laws. Do you want to answer all those in one fell swoop or do you want to go through this? Sure, I, I might break them apart a little bit. <laughs> Kids is one of those differences that is really important to figure out, right? So there are some perpetual problems which you, you can figure out a really fun, creative solution. But if someone really does not want kids and the other person really does want kids, there's not really a temporary agreement for the in-between, right? It's not mm -hmm. like, oh, well, we'll have one this year and then we'll check in <laughs> about how you're feeling about it. Um, and there's also timelines and all sorts of stuff. So one thing that I suggest to people is to be really honest upfront about what you think in the moment about kids. Also, you can have freedom to change your mind, right? I have had many people say, I never ever want kids. And then they are in a relationship, things change in their life. And they're like, I do want kids. Um, I've also had people say, I want kids. And then later on, they say, I don't think I want it. The, the thing that you have to remember though, is that there's certain contracts, I call them contracts, that you start a relationship with. And you have to be willing to verbally change them. You have to let the other person know, I know that I said I never wanted kids and that's how we started this. I've changed my mind. And then you have to recognize that the other person has the right to either sign their name on the dotted line or not when you change that contract. And so sometimes that change will, um, you know, end the relationship because they might say, I still haven't changed my mind. I still don't want kids or I still do. So being upfront as possible in the beginning and then as you shift, continuing to be upfront is really important. Um, if you do want kids, I think you really have to talk about what does that look like? Um, you know, where, where did you learn about parenting? How did you see parenting? What do you want it to look like in our relationship? What are some things you think would be bothersome to you? Um, and really having conversations with that. And then once you are a parent, you need to keep talking about it because there's so many things you don't even recognize until you get there. And then you're like, whoa, this isn't working for me. I don't know why I said that it would. I think I need it to be a little bit different. But kids, it needs to be as like open, direct, honest as possible. You don't want to create resentment around something that really should be so beautiful, having kids. Um, but if it's done without full buy-in, it can kind of be a problem sometimes. I have a girlfriend that ended an engagement for that exact reason. Hmm. They, When they entered the relationship, you know, that contract was they both wanted kids one day and then she realized she wasn't sure if she wanted kids and he was 100% sure he wanted kids and they parted ways over that. And I think it was the best decision both, both of them made, even though it was so difficult in the moment. It's That's not going to get easier over time if you continue no. to disagree. Yeah. As she said, you can't compromise on kids. You yeah. can't have half a kid. Yeah. Or you can't have a kid and then be like, I don't want to yeah, do that anymore. Yeah, then return it to the store. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can compromise on a lot. You can compromise on the way you parent. You can compromise, you know, you can create agreements around that. But like there has to be buy-in on each person's behalf that they want a child um, or it creates a lot of problems down the road. Uh, just one follow up on that. Do you find um, couples that have kids to kind of fix the marriage or to try to get closer or like? Is it as a solution as opposed to just because we want to have kids? Do you see that often? I think that any major relationship transition can be seen as a beacon of hope <laughs> that things will mm -hmm. get better. So whether it's, I just hope we get engaged because then once we get engaged, I'm going to feel more secure. You know, I'll know that they really care about me. Um, once we have kids, then it'll mean that we're really committed to each other and my partner will be around more often or whatever it is. So I think that sometimes we put so much hope into these transitions, which certainly tie us together, um, but they don't necessarily make things better. And we accidentally see the tying together as being something that's going to make it feel good when really it often makes it more complicated um, and that there's a lot of other work underneath 
that can make it feel good. But yeah, I've certainly seen people say, I think that we just need to start building our family and then things will feel better. Um, right. But more often than not, that's probably a, a road you don't want to travel down. You want to fix the oh, relationship yeah. outside of having a child. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good, good, Andy. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Okay. This one comes up a lot, a lot. In-laws. How to navigate in-laws. This one comes up as mu- like, I would say top three. Mm. Dealing. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure. Dealing with in-laws that you feel are meddling, uh, over-involved. Mm-hmm. Do you have any tips? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a big one. And again, it's, it's sometimes one of these perpetual problems. We might've both had a different dream for what family looks like. So for, I can use even a personal example. I am very family oriented. So like if any one of my cousins or sisters or family members wanted to come spend the week at my house, I'd be like, here's the key. You can use our garage. Here's your bedroom. Stay as long as you want. And my husband is much more, um, insular, right? He really likes our nuclear family and he wants to know if people are coming over and he'd like to know what are the constraints of that. So the first thing to talk about is just what are our different views on this? Instead of looking at you always let your mom do X, Y, and Z, and that's because you don't respect me. Or why why don't you ever want to do family events? You must not love us. I always ask couples to try to take a step back and say, what's this about for you? You know, if my husband could say to me, hey, you know, honey, sometimes you like have these people over and I don't know what's happening, but can you tell me why that's important to you? I would answer that. I would say, oh, I grew up with lots of sisters and it just feels so good to have lots of people hanging out and I like to be connected. And then could I say to him, why is it important to you that we know when it's happening and there's boundaries. And he would say, well, I need a lot of alone time. I like to spend time one-on-one with you. I feel kind of neglected if I don't have that. Then again, we can go back into a conversation of, oh, well, how do we do both of these things? What are some creative solutions? So start there. Now, let's say you've started there and you've created these solutions and my cousin still comes over every single week and we're not following what was agreed upon. It's really important as a couple that you see yourselves as a we. And one of the biggest problems with outsiders with, um, I think Stan Tatkin calls them thirds is that they are, you, you can be more loyal to them than to your partner. And so are you able to say things like, we have decided that this weekend's not gonna work and that, you know, or we've decided that when the baby's at your house, it's really important that they still go to bed by 9 p.m. We are a united front. When in-laws become a problem, it's because there's no united front. Mm. Someone is saying, Hey, you know, Andrew doesn't really want to come this weekend, but um, do you think that, you know, I might just come instead of saying we've decided we're not coming. Mm -hmm. So one of the things when in-laws is a problem is I really suggest talking about what's your united front? How are you protecting your nucleus Um, with an understanding of both people's needs. So it can't become a rigid nucleus where, you know, my husband would say, Liz, no one's ever allowed to stay in our house. That wouldn't work. I would fight against that and then we'd have problems, but it it has to be something we've agreed on together. And then using that us and we language is really important. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that answer. That's a great one. Yeah. That really resonates. Yeah, it resonates big time and it comes up a lot. Um, my final question for you, Elizabeth, I, I almost, I feel bad even asking it because you have a fantastic Huffington Post article about this. <laughs> and so I can, I'm going to give you the option. We can either set you free now, or if you want to give just a sort of Cliff's Notes answer and we can refer people to the article, but infidelity and tips for a couple choosing to work through it, staying together in the wake of an affair. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the biggest tips are if they want to look at that article, they can, but we're going to link it out for sure. Cause it was there so great. There are three steps that are really important to go through. Number one, atonement. That's really being able to look at what you need to do to make it right. So the responsibility of the person that had the affair is to rebuild trust. And sometimes it's in ways that aren't comfortable. Um, I often say that it's as if the bank account got overdrawn and now you have a fee. So in a, a relationship in normal times, you're not paying fees back, but you have to pay a fee. And the person who's been harmed has to be really clear on what that fee is. So it might look like saying, I really need you to come home by the end of the workday every day because the affair happened at the workplace. Um, so, you know, it takes 30 minutes to get home. I want to see you at 530. That's how you'll rebuild my trust. I really want you to turn your Facebook off for now. You know, you had an affair on Facebook, so can't happen until you rebuild my trust. And then the other person would have to be able to, to do that action. Of course, there's choice here. They could say no, but they're not going to rebuild trust. The other piece is the capacity to listen to the harm that was done. So can you hear the story of how you impacted the other person? Um, and that in the beginning stages, it really is about tending to the wounds of the person that was harmed first. So sometimes the, the person who um, violated the relationship will have their own stuff going on. Totally understandable, you know. I was really hurting. I was feeling distant. This I'm really sad that I had to break off this affair because I also liked this person, but they really need to zip their lips about that until they've been able to hear the pain. The second stage is attunement, being able to reconnect with what happened, um, figuring out where they might've been out of tune with each other for um, the door to kind of even open to this, how they could prevent it in the future, what they're going to communicate about moving forward, how they can rebuild intimacy. And then the final stage is working on how to reattach, which means in this new relationship, how what do we want intimacy to look like? How are we going to play again? How are we going to date again? How are we going to start having sex with each other without having horrible flashbacks all the time or whatever it is, but actually feeling the relationship as not just a, a wounded thing, but a thing that feels good again. I love that I was like, give a quick answer to like the most complicated question <laughs> ever. Like, boom. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so no getting even in there? Nothing, nothing about getting <laughs> even? Nothing even. So nah. it's interesting because people just can't help themselves. And sometimes they do get even. And then we have a tough time figuring out who do we start with. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I can see that happening. Unless, unless it's a agreed upon contract to get even. Unless it was, yeah. Well, and sometimes there are agreed upon things, right? Like mm -hmm. I, the only way I'm going to be able to build trust again is actually if we take some space and I figure out what I want here. Um, but yeah, try not to violate another contract in the relationship because then we've got two relational norm violations. Yeah, and then we have potentially a rom com we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah a <laughs> rom com. It gets really complicated because it's like, okay, you're both hurt and you both have to rebuild trust. Where do we start? So, try to keep yourself in whatever position has has been created. Yeah, the ultimate two wrongs. Yeah, yeah, yeah no exactly. Good. No boy, no. Elizabeth, that was enlightening and just fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Yeah, You're that was welcome. great. Thanks for having me. Such great advice. I learned a lot. So are we going to make it or what's, <laughs> what's your yeah, assessment? <laughs> okay, <sorry>. Yay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining us. And and we look forward yeah. to following you and, and seeing all that you do. Oh, I, I was upset when I saw A Better Life didn't serve New York. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> As I stalked you and I was like, ah, oh, this is really interesting. One to day, me. maybe. So, one one day. Laws are so fun to deal with. <laughs> okay, Elizabeth, thank you. We will set you free. Enjoy your Thursday. Thank you so much thank for joining you us. Too. I also what? just wanted to say your background is beautiful. I love it. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I love it's the gallery wall. That's mainly Charlene. <laughs> <laughs> New York pad. Yeah. It's thank very you. cool. I love it. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Have a good one. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <sighs> Well, that was fascinating. Enlightening. 
Enlightening. It was so interesting how that whole second category of questions, like everyone's relationship questions, that she pretty much answered with one giant answer. Yeah, it was incredible. She really gave like very. I mean, that was val- that that was a good session. It was a good session. We got we got our money's worth yeah, on that right. one. Right, everyone got their money's worth. Well, and what's funny is she was her answers were so. Um, how, what's the word? I don't want to, uh, they just sort of included everything universal. you could need to, Universal. And they really touched on like every little facet that yeah. you might need that I ended up crossing out questions as we were going because she ended up sort of answering an adjacent question. Yeah. She basically answered the whole couples therapy <laughs> question. She was just like, this is it. And you know, before we started, I was nervous that we didn't have enough questions. Yeah. No, I knew it would flow with her. There's just, it's one of those topics. It's just... Finds its and way. she was just good at talking She's about great. it, man. Yeah. And it's really, you know, it's interesting. It always comes down to communication. It's all various forms of communication. Like you have to have solid, open and honest communication. Yeah. That's really the crux of every relationship. And the ability to take responsibility, mm-hmm. like recognize why you're feeling the way you're feeling and being able to com- communication often involves communicating how you're feeling and if you cannot own right why you're feeling the way you're feeling then it's oh right i'm not saying just communicating like you're doing everything wrong you suck i'm the best like you actually healthy communication yeah we definitely we agree on that yeah Yeah. (laughs) you're right and it's interesting that she said that the main reason they even come to her in the first place is often like what is presented to her whether Mm -hmm. or not that is the real reason is yeah we want to better our communication yeah and then those four horsemen it's like when you when those start happening, it's over. That's it. What were the four? I think the four are there four were, things, or is it just an expression? I, I, I wasn't one hundred percent sure, but I think it's possible that the four were like always, never. Oh, okay. I think there were four things like you always oh, do this, okay. you never do this, or, or maybe it's just a general. I wasn't really getting it, and I was embarrassed to ask again. I so. think, I, and I answered the question that you asked wrong. Like you, I answered a different question. Like we, but the point is, is the four horsemen, whether they be four things or mm-hmm. do, or, or it's just an or expression, it's just a general expression, yeah. means like when these things happen, it's over. I think that's what the the gist was. I appreciate that because I feel like a lot of people do want a sort of they want like a legend. Yeah. You, a lot of, a lot of the questions we get are how do you know when? They want something to refer to. And so something like that is helpful. It's like yeah. these words the way you use this language equals four horsemen which equals the apocalypse. <laughs> it's right. And yeah. I and I would add to the four horsemen like the things we've experienced like there are certain things that we hear from our calling people or our q a mm-hmm. folks that's like oh it's it's over yeah you know this is a dynamic that is not good you need to run you yeah. need to go away and i think it's important that people know those there's not that many of them there aren't that many four horsemen things i agree with that yeah oftentimes i, I feel hesitant to tell people that it's over unless it's like four horsemen ish yeah, I mean, we're stealing the. Four we're we're using four. I don't yeah. know if it's either, there's anything to I mean, steal. It's been it. around for about two thousand years, but still. We're yeah, we're going to start this, in this from context. this day forward. We will <laughs> reference the four horsemen. Yes. <laughs> Was there anything that surprised you today? Anything you learned? Oh, um, I learned that divorced couples can successfully live together and raise kids while dating other people. It's I'm kind so of impressed with those people. Super. Just impressive. because the amount of discord that probably needs to be there for you to get divorced in the first place means that that's all the more impressive yeah i mean that's wow because divorce is complicated expensive to to traumatic. agree that you literally want to separate your your legal bond yeah yet not leave it's the amazing. premises yeah it's incredible yes it's it's such a combination of of sort of um, dysfunction and high function. Yeah. It's really interesting. The big lesson for me was the in-laws question because we do get asked that a lot. Mm-hmm. A lot of questions yeah. are my mother. It's often my mother-in-law is pressuring me to do this or is too involved with my husband or that kind of thing. And I thought her answer was going to be more along the lines of you you need the your husband or or the the one related to the in law yeah. to sort of be the mediator or like to sort of step in, but instead she was focusing more on the we nucleus yeah. thing. That was interesting. That was too. really interesting. Yeah, you're forcing your partner to choose you in that. Yeah, which I wasn't expecting her to say. 
No, it's a really important usage of the we. Semantics. Yeah. They matter. Like a lot of people make fun of couples that are like, we like this movie yeah. or we like this song. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of embarrassing. Is. But, <laughs> but in this context, it's important. It unified is. Unified front. Yeah. Unified front. I loved that. Yeah. All right. I think we can wrap there. Mm-hmm. If you enjoyed what you heard today, you can like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, follow us on Instagram, um, leave iTunes reviews, leave iTunes ratings, tell your friends. And I think that's it for this episode of Dear Shane. Sure is. This hot topic. <laughs> this is quite hot. This one was pretty hot. It was a lot of topics. Yeah. I could have asked her. Topics. So, Like there were, there was a lot I wanted to ask her. So you'd have to start paying after this. This is, this yeah, is I a know. consultation. <laughs> this was a, the yeah. um, um, amuse-bouche <laughs> nice. of couples therapy. Yes. <laughs> just, well done. Thanks. All right. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next time on Dear Shandy. Bye.